Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending. Water, such a simple molecule. Two hydrogen, one oxygen. Yet, so very difficult to, to manage, even more difficult to govern. The era that water is an unlimited resource is now ending. Lessons from all around the globe, and yes, even here in Canada, demonstrate limits exist, and we must learn to live in those limits. Issues such as ecosystem degradation, a changing climate, impacts on water systems, droughts, floods, increasing uncertainty, perpetual growth in population, urban spaces, and resource extraction collectively conspire to challenge our current approaches. The notion of water security and emphasizes that we might need to find some new ideas and think about ecology. My view, water scarcity is a social dilemma, not a technical concern, a problem that requires attention to the social context that shape decisions, attitudes, and our collective behavior. Innovation, new ideas, and processes for collective decision making, and better ways to engage communities, First Nations, and those impacted are absolutely critical. And with this, it is my great pleasure to welcome a number of esteemed guests and you all to join us. My name is Oliver Brandis. I'm the co-director at the University of Victoria's Polis Project on Ecological Governance. I'm absolutely thrilled that you could all attend. Before we begin the formal discussion, however, I would like to acknowledge that this, is, this gathering takes place on coast and straight Salish territory. Also, a few housekeeping items. Number one, we will be webcasting tonight. So yes, our speakers and our collective discussion will be going across Canada, perhaps even around the world. Um, <clears throat> this live webcast uh, will be filmed out, up from top there. But in addition, if you have any concerns about being filmed, please indicate to either Laura or Jesse, where I'm not sure Jesse's right there, or we can uh, talk to the folks in the back if you would like your comments or you would not like to be on the webcast. Uh, when we hit that portion, after we've had a couple of presentations, we'll have the audience questions. That's why we'd like to use the mics, so you can see the mics at the end of either of the, hall, uh, either of the uh, alleys there. Also, if you wouldn't mind, please turn off any uh, cell phones or Blackberries or other such devices, and it, washrooms are just across the hall there. So the format for this evening is I'll, I will uh, commence by introducing two of our international guest speakers. They will each speak for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. At that point, I will introduce Rob DeLoe, who's already perched in his spot for keen dialogue commencement. His job will be to stimulate our discussion and to initiate and to integrate a bit of what we heard and put it in a nice Canadian context. At that point, I will also uh, remind you to uh, ask your questions. Um, also, if you have a comment, that's appreciated, but perhaps let's keep the additional lectures or monologues to a minimum. So let's try and keep that fairly focused. Um, and again, I will remind everybody that we are being webcast and if you have any concerns around that. So with no further ado, let me introduce our two guest speakers. We will start with uh, Professor Lee Godden. She is a professor and director of the Center of Resources and Energy and Environmental Law at Melbourne School of Law uh, from Australia. Her research uh, interests include water law and environmental law, natural resource management, and indigenous land rights. She is currently involved in several research projects around environmental governance in climate change era. She coordinates a national water governance research network in Australia. Engagement with the theoretical and grounded aspects of law is a hallmark of Lee's work. It's distinguished by its interdisciplinary approach, and she maintains a focus on legal theory, drawing on her background in law and geography. Her work has appeared in leading international journals as well as leading Australian law journals. Following Lee will be uh, Dr. Tim O'Reardon. Tim is an emeritus professor of environmental sciences at the University of East Anglia. He has edited a number of key books on the institutional aspects of global environmental change, policy, and practice, and led two international research projects on the transition to sustainability in the European Union. 
Professor Reardon is a European advisor to the UK Sustainable Development Commission and a member of Sustainable East and the East of England Sustainable Development Roundtable. His research deals with themes associated with better governance for sustainability. So let's bring uh, Dr. Godden up and enjoy an interesting conversation. Thank you. And I too would like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples of this part of Canada. It's a great pleasure to be here. And in some ways, when we look at water, one might at least think that there are not too many similarities between Canada and Australia. Canada, as I've experienced in the last few days, can often be wet and you have a lot more water on the coast uh, here on Vancouver Island than I've perhaps experienced for quite some time um, in Australia. And Australia, of course, has been dealing with water scarcity issues for quite some time. But what I would like to stress following Oliver's uh, comments is that water managing and water governance are people problems. And so I think that the differences that might at least appear on the surface around different nations' approaches, I think there's a lot to be learned because uh, Ultimately, we're dealing with governance and institutions and people problems and people solutions as opposed to technical problems. So uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Okay. Today what I want to do in looking at a case study is to work across three levels in thinking about watershed governance and the models that might be appropriate and uh, to introduce these concepts. and. I'd really welcome questions in the break or as we go, uh, if the points of clarification that you would like. And so essentially, I'm going to look at the national level water reforms uh, because Australia has been engaged in a long standing process of water law reform over the past 20 years. And I like to think of it as a a process of um, social and economic restructuring of the relationship between the private sphere of economics and, and social relationships and uh, what was once regarded as more firmly the public realm of politics and the state. And I think this iteration between those two forces is uh, very palpable when we look at the changes that have taken place in water law and governance in Australia. So I'll be working at that national level and I think many people will already be familiar with the case study I'm going to use and that's the Murray-Darling Basin. But I really want to pinpoint um, water planning aspects and the lessons that can be uh, learned in that arena. The second area that I want to look at is in a regional context and I probably don't have to tell Canadians that uh, federalism bedevils <laughs> uh, water management in particular ways in Australia because I'm, I'm sure that those federal tensions uh, also exist here in Canada, but potentially also federalism brings its own solutions. So I really want to look at regional government and also at uh, provincial water law and look at a couple of particular innovations in governance there. The environmental water holder from my state of Victoria, um, and I'll talk about that. And I also then want to uh, also look at an innovative project around uh, Indigenous involvement in water planning and uh, offer a few thoughts there. And then finally, I want to bring it really right down to the local level and to watershed planning, or in Australia as we call it, catchment uh, planning and, and collaborative governance in the context of catchment management authorities. Okay, but um, probably to state the obvious, when we're looking at water governance and water law, water policy, we're looking at governing complexity. And for Australia, this is a slide that um, I've taken from the water governance framework under the National Adaptation Research uh, Framework for dealing with climate change. So this is one where we were particularly looking at climate change, but it has clear... Uh, application in the water governance context as well. Um, so we, we're looking at new federal arrangements. So this is the national water reforms. We also need to bear in mind though that we're still dealing with cross-jurisdictional uh, law policies and practices that have been embedded for a long time. Then there are, um, with the various provincial governments, we've had uh, state water laws 
Uh, we started with the common law inherited from Britain, and then uh, each state and territory developed its own statutory water laws over time, so we're, we're dealing with those. Then we come down to areas such as the catchment management authorities or equivalents, and also then we have separate governance uh, in our cities. And then we go right down, of course, to our local land and water managers and citizens, and all of this, of course, uh, being impinged upon by international developments, either treaties, uh, and these play an important role at a federal level in Australia in terms of providing a basis for Commonwealth federal power to legislate in the arena of um, water. And of course, we also are experiencing in Australia the, extre um, the extremes, uh, and so we're looking at uh, drought and flood. Now, it's not always possible to directly pinpoint how an extreme event may be exacerbated by climate change, but we're seeing broad patterns of increased probabilities of these um, extreme events. So, governing complexity. So how has Australia responded uh, across some 20 years or more when it's embarked upon this program of water law and policy reform? And initially it started uh, well, it's been ongoing, but I would say the, the current phase of reform started in 1994 with the COAG, or Council of Australian Governments, first stage of reforms. It was recognised at the time that um, many of our, cat, our watersheds were experiencing long-term environmental degradation. At that time, in particular, it was salinity and rising groundwater levels that were um, of a lot of concern, obviously allied with other sorts of uh, river quality issues as well. And so there was a strong move to embark through an intergovernmental process on setting uh, a framework for reform. And one of the critical changes that occurred was that uh, we'd had a nexus between land and water since the colonisation of Australia, and that was broken with the COAG reforms where there was an actual separation of land holding from water holding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the specific Victorian laws that deal with it. But this was one of the fundamental changes. So it's now possible to hold water rights, I could use that term loosely, but water rights independent of land holding, and water can be traded independent of, of land. And so this was a very large experiment, if you like, in a cap and trade system and the adoption of market mechanisms. The Productivity Commission, which is a major research think tank uh, of the uh, federal government, was very um, prominent in pushing the development of these uh, market mechanisms. Um, the other important aspect to this first stage of reforms was the recognition of environmental water requirements. So the, the uh, twin prongs of efficiency in our water use and uh, the adoption of water trading and so on through the property mechanisms, but also the recognition that there was a, a need for the environment to have its own water. Uh, it's perhaps a bit ironic when one thinks actually that uh, we all depend on environmental water in this broader sense, but nonetheless this was the way in which it was framed that there were to be discrete entitlements, if you like, to um, the environment. Uh, that process occurred largely by the federal government initiating reforms by a series of tied grants, so-called fiscal federalism. Um, and so the Commonwealth government didn't directly assume responsibility in the southeast uh, basin area, in the Murray-Darling Basin area, for the reform in, in terms of on-the-ground implementation. It uh, worked through the state governments and offered carrots in, in uh, incentive payments to the state governments to introduce these uh, water ref law reforms. And uh, so we saw a, a series of changes where, uh, for example, in Victoria, you uh, saw amendments to legislation which put in place water uh, property, property water rights. And um, so it moved on, but we, the pace of reform was very variable, it was very um, fraught. One of the major ideas was that um, the market mechanism, a cap and trade, would uh, be the basis for structural change and would move um, water from very inefficient uses, such as extensive irrigation of pasture and so on, to much 
higher value uses. So that was part of the idea that this would be a major structural adjustment. That wasn't occurring uh, quickly enough, it was um, regarded, and we were also seeing a much worsening condition in the environmental arena in that uh, on top of a lot of degradation over many years and many catchments, we started to have very severe drought conditions. So in 2004, we saw a major initiative, the National Water Initiative, um, and uh, it sets out a blueprint of principles that are to uh, guide and further implement the water reform process. So those are some of the points that uh, I've put on the screen there. Those were some of the principles, and you, you could see that... Uh, so we have the need to improve security of water allocations uh, and to ensure ecosystem uh, health. Some of these, I would suggest, are intention, and I'll pick up this point uh, a little later, but um, the imp improving security of water allocation, one of the major problems that is well recognised through the Murray-Darling Basin, for instance, is serious over-allocation of many catchments. And in some instances, there's more water allocated or at that point there was more water allocated than actually existed in the catchment or in the watershed. So you can see we had some serious problems there. Um, the water markets had been occurring for a little while, so there was a chance to review how they were functioning. And there was also, for the first time in 2004, quite belatedly, a recognition that urban water supply needed some attention. And you start to see the development of water-sensitive urban design uh, principles and so on becoming embedded in the National Water Initiative. So this is a policy document uh, elaborating principles that was to, to, go, uh, to guide the process of reform further. At that time, there was also another major intergovernmental agreement. These are agreements being reached by all the state and territory governments working with the federal government. And at that time, there was another um, agreement, the so-called Living Murray Agreement. And that was a specific if you like, emergency measure, where it was agreed that a certain amount of funding would be allocated to buy water for very significant ecological assets along the length of the Murray-Darling uh, Basin. I might add that the Murray-Darling Basin crosses four states and one territory. So uh, I was discussing with a member uh, of the policy team about transboundary water. And although we're one nation, we certainly have our share of transboundary water issues at an interjurisdictional conflict level. Um, <clears throat> one of the issues around over-allocation is that each state uh, is allocated so much water uh, to that state for its use in irrigated um, agriculture, for example, which is our major use of inland water supply. Something like 70% of Australia, uh, its water use is uh, tied up in irrigated agriculture. So the arrangements between states for allocation is a very um, conflicted process and uh, that really has been the basis of a lot of the concerns in terms of uh, trying to address over allocation. Okay, so that was the reform process. We've also instituted at a, a governance level a, a range of different institutions and so on at a national level to deal in various ways with our reform process. So as we've articulated different legal arrangements, for example, water holdings separated from land, we've also developed quite a, an extensive new governance structure. Uh, coming out of that period in 2004, we also saw the uh, development of the National Water Commission, which is uh, meant to function almost as a, an umpire, if you like, which, um, it's given the task of reviewing and assessing how the reforms are uh, developing. And it issued a major report late last year, and it basically was looking at a scorecard of whether, in fact, those governance reforms had been effective. And you'll see there there's an emphasis, for example, on transparency. So where there is good water governance, people know the rules, and uh, they know the roles and responsibilities of the people involved. Okay, so 
that was the process up to about 2004. What we were witnessing then was very severe drought. Uh, many people feel that it was related to climate uh, change effects. And it was obvious that there was severe ecological degradation across many areas of the Murray-Darling Basin. So uh, we saw the Commonwealth assume responsibility by initiating for the first time in almost 100, well, in 100 years of federation, um, a new Federal Water Act, largely to deal with this interjurisdictional conflict over water allocation. So we have a Commonwealth Water Act 2007. Um, it's interesting that the federal government has no direct power over water in its constitution, so it, it relied on a series of in, what's called indirect heads of power to initiate this legislation, including giving effect to international obligations such as the biodiversity conservation uh, um, convention and also uh, the Ramsar Wetland Convention. The, the sort of changes that this Water Act put in place, I would sort of draw to your attention. First of all, it uh, attempted to set ecologically sustainable development objectives for the entire Murray-Darling Basin area and there was to be a priority given to, to giving effect to these international obligations, for example, protecting um, critical wetlands and so on. There was also to be a basin-wide plan to achieve sust a sustainable level of take. As I mentioned previously, the reforms were, that were initiated in 1994 were premised on the idea that there would be a cap and trade system. And so we, we already had a a cap put in place at 1995 levels, but that uh, still, for, uh, still allowed serious over allocation. So the idea was that under this Commonwealth Water Act, what we would see was a much more stringent capping of water use. So the idea being that you cap, this, there's no more water coming to the state, so there's no more water going to individual users. So for example, if you wanted to start a winery, then you would have to buy water. So if you're um, working in an area, a new industry or so on, rather than uh, having pre-existing water rights, for example, you uh, may be required to go out and buy water on the market. So this was the idea of the cap and trade system. Um, as well as looking at the sustainable level of take, uh, and that was going to be set across the entire Murray, well, is being set across the entire Murray-Darling Basin area. There were also salinity management and environmental watering plans. So there was a specific, there's a specific plan nested within the overarching Murray-Darling Basin plan for environmental water needs. There was also a new governance structure, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and there was a particular attempt to try to isolate the Murray-Darling Basin Authority from the day-to-day -day haggle, the political intrigues between the states and so on. I would say that we've not been hugely successful in ensuring the independence of uh, that new structure. There was also another new entity, and this was the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, a statutory agency, if you like, but with responsibility for buying back water on the market, for example, to go in there and to provide water for the most uh, critically endangered ecological assets, for example. And also then institutions around water markets because the trade by that time had accelerated and so we were seeing um, a lot of, of uh, trade and our competition and consumer body, the ACCC, was given the task of formulating explicit trade rules in this area. So the markets aren't free markets by any means, they are structured markets and they are governed by these water, mar uh, water market rules, but the idea is for the market eventually to be a market where there are little restrictions on trading both intra-catchment or intercatchment, and that means between um, states. So we already have some uh, water trading going up and down the Murray, for example. Okay, so how did we do? And I'm happy to expand further on these, but I think there's a general consensus that the reforms have been uh, 
quite feasible in terms of their socio-economic outcomes. So there have been considerable economic benefits from the NWI reforms. We've seen a much more efficient use of water, and this is uh, exemplified by that figure I put up there, that despite having a 70% reduction of water diversions in the drought, we uh, didn't see a huge decline in irrigated agricultural production. So the, it has certainly driven the efficiencies. There have been both positive and negative social consequences. Uh, many rural communities felt extremely threatened by, for example, the ideas of uh, putting in place a sustainable level of take that would be more stringent, because that meant, of course, that they uh, were looking to lose uh, the volumes of water that they'd uh, traditionally used. So there was strong opposition. And the photo is of burning copies of the Murray-Darling Basin draft plan in rural communities in uh, parts of inland Australia. Uh, from our environmental outcomes, I think it's fair to say we've had fairly poor and at times quite perverse environmental outcomes. We still haven't dealt effectively with over allocation in many catchments. However, the largest water holder in Australia at the moment is the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. So there are massive in, uh, holdings. Now exactly how that is to be deployed and how it's to be deployed for the best environmental effect are open questions at the moment. So, so the whole idea of how the governance of the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder works is uh, being debated at the moment. Now of course the Basin Plan, it was very ambitious, it was meant to be put in place um, within very tight timeframes. We will get a cap, but it's been progressively weakened. At first, it was to be uh, aligned to best scientific practice, best scientific principles. It has been considerably weakened, and I think it's a question now as to whether it will give priority to ecologically sustainable development outcomes. And of course, there's a lot less urgency because it's rained. I'd now like to go from those broad-scale national reforms to focus on how it had ramifications at the level of a provincial uh, water manager, the Victorian um, government and the Department of Sustainability and Environment, which manages a lot of the water. Okay, I said that there was this um, separation of land and water holdings, and Victoria has been very prolific in developing uh, water trade, so it's a, a quite a strong market in the water trade in Victoria. How this was done was, I talked about the separation of land and water, and in fact, it's a bit more complex than that, because what happens is that what you actually trade is called a water share. And rather than it being a defined volume of water, what it actually is, and this I think is the really neat thing, is that it's a percentage variable share of the water available. So, for example, if you are a, a dairy farmer in central Victoria, your water share now isn't of a set amount, volume of water. It's a percentage share of what is available in the water storage. And that, of course, can vary. In a drought year, it may be 10% of nothing. In a good year, it might be 110%. So this is the idea of a variable share of water that is available. And this has been introduced across all the southeastern states. The, the mechanism, the legal mechanism varies, but um, nonetheless, they are basically water shares and they are a proportionate use. So this has been a major reform in this area to deal with variability. Um, this, is, this process has also been called unbundling. So your water right will, uh, in Victoria, comprise this variable water share. You will need a water license, and you'll also need a delivery share because it's very expensive public infrastructure to deliver irrigation water and so on. So you actually have as a component of this where you must um, contribute to a delivery share which contributes to upkeep of um, irrigation channels and so on. The other major reform was an environmental water reserve. And again in uh, Victoria we now see quite significant holdings of environmental water. The other major thing that has resurfaced and uh, I think has been given re-emphasis uh, in recent reforms is water planning and resource assessment. So there were a series of sustainable water strategies uh, where you had uh, 
basically a planning strategic assessment process looking at the state of the water resource and doing some long-term planning. There's a 15-year cycle for those water assessments and interestingly the water shares that are held by individuals, there is a potential for the minister to vary them if he or she finds that there's been a decline in the overall water resource. So if our degradation is getting worse, there's, going, there's the capacity to change individual entitlements. It's going to be very politically contentious, but nonetheless, uh, that's there. We, we also see quite strong river health um, strategies developing as well. Okay, I now want to turn from the overall areas uh, looking at, for example, environmental water. I just draw your attention to this Victorian environmental water holder, which is the latest of, of uh, significant governance reforms. And it's an attempt to insulate <sighs> decision-making around water from day-to-day -day political uh, pressures. So there's uh, the, the Victorian environmental water holder, and it has, it's a corp corporation and it currently is buying water. There's also a suspicion that in the very near future it might also be trading in water and selling water on behalf of the environment and, and thus building up um, finance for uh, environmental water. So if I turn from those provincial level um, issues to look at the on the ground, very localised catchment management, Victoria um, has had a long standing engagement with catchment management or, or watershed uh, management around collaborative models. And so that's our map of our current catchments. That's the state of Victoria and those are the um, catchment areas there where these catchment management authorities operate. Now they are different to a statutory water authority. I should emphasise that they are not the same thing as a water authority. And those are the goals of uh, catchment management. You can see there, I've taken that from uh, the, Cat the Victorian Catchment Management Council, and you can pick up the things like ecologically sustainable development, but also community involvement is, is top of the list. Community involvement in and commitment to natural resource management. Now, the CMAs are a bit of a hybrid body in terms of governance structures. Uh, that's the governing legislation, the Catchment and Land Protection Act, but what do they do? This is a, a, comes from the Statement of Obligations that is a quasi-legal document given to each authority. So they must develop a regional catchment strategy, and I'll uh, show you one of those in a moment. They must implement special area plans. So for example, if groundwater is a problem in the area, they might have a special area plan in relation to groundwater protection and so on. Um, they also need to coordinate regional catchment investment plans. The um, catchment strategies set priorities and goals and objectives, say, for a 20-year period, and that's then backed by these catchment investment plans that, if you like, put the money where the mouth is in terms of delivering on those um, goals. It's also very strongly integrated with our land care um, and our land stewardship, so you can't effectively manage water, I would suggest, without also managing land and vegetation and so on. And uh, those are some of the other functions that a catchment management authority has. Um, so they can sort of have some referral into, for example, um, some of the land use planning. But it's, it's quite limited. I wouldn't um, like to suggest that it's um, <clears throat> very extensive. Very typical waterway that we're dealing with in Victoria. And that just gives you some of the water functions uh, that you'll notice floodplain management and so on, and they also manage in the environmental water entitlements, the environmental water. Now that's sort of shared with the environmental water holder. This is an example of the most recent regional catchment strategy that's just been put out by uh, the Karangamite uh, Catchment Management Authority, and you can look at it on the web if you'd like um, some further detail. It's got very which you probably can't see, I realise now, but if you do go and look at it on the web, you can see that it's got um, a, a process for implementation and strategic planning and so on. So just to finish off, um, we've got a long history of, of looking at collaborative uh, water governance at a localised uh, watershed management situation. 
those are some of the strengths I've put on that side. Um, those are some of the, the weaknesses that I, I perceive in the system at the moment. Perhaps those are some things that we can um, look at in question time. And I'd like to just allow a couple of minutes just to alert you to a quite innovative uh, program that is seeking to better engage Indigenous peoples across uh, Northern Australia in particular. And this is the track, the um, Tropical Rivers and um, Cultural Knowledge Project. So it's um, very much at the level of wanting to engage Indigenous peoples in terms of their uh, traditional knowledge and to have that Indigenous uh, sorry, traditional knowledge incorporated into governance. Those are some of the track guiding principles there. So we've got a whole range of experiments. If I could just um, conclude now with some key lessons that I think can be learnt from the Australian situation that we might pick up when we uh, look at some of the questions. So... I would suggest that watershed governance needs to be fit for purpose and very dynamic. Setting appropriate scales and responsibilities needs to be iterative and dynamic. We just can't stand still in these areas. Institutional change is difficult, very difficult, but necessary. But it must be supported with sufficient decision-making powers, enforcement capacity and resources at a watershed level. We need to critically evaluate the mechanisms to see if they're working. And collaborative processes need to be substantial, not rhetorical. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. That's wonderful. What a great way to get things going here. So now I'm going to ask Tim to come up. We will get Tim ready here. Uh, by the way, coming to British Columbia is coming home for me. I have two homes, one in England and one in Canada. So being here and being with my family here is a great joy and I'm grateful to the organisers for creating what is known in Canada as a boondoggle, which means that uh, <laughs> and my English friends can't quite understand what a boondoggle is. I said, don't worry about it because we're all on it, but this one is particularly a nice one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and keep to the 25 minutes, but I'm going to try and stir you up at the same time to give us some idea of what is actually the, the key issues associated with water from the point of view of what this conference is about, which is what is actually good water governance. And Lee has very kindly started the process, so I will take you a bit further on that. Uh, and this will be spent a bit of time tomorrow in the conference, but I'm going to whistle through them now because we... We, when we deal with governance, we deal with cultures. And cultures are, we're all in cultures, and in different cultures. We're in cultures of work, we're in cultures of play, we're in cultures of art, we're in cultures of intellectual endeavor, and so on. They're essentially arrangements whereby you have a shared value, you have a sense of identity, and you have unwritten rules which you tend to conform to without realizing that you're conforming to them. But the point about most cultures is they're often ring-fenced. So when you rub up against another culture, you don't understand the same language. You don't necessarily communicate, even though there's a common language called English or French or Portuguese or whatever. But cultures don't always appreciate the positions that they take. So, for example, you can find a culture around fish, a culture around conservation, a culture around water use, my favourite example of this in England is the Dove Soap Company, the people who were operated by Procter and Gamble, have now created two shampoos, a shampoo for the morning and a shampoo for the evening. This is directed mostly at females, and young females in particular, but I don't want to be particularly gender-specific, and I'm sure some males follow this practice. And what it means is that the request is that you have a shower in the morning and a shower in the evening and put different shampoos on, and preferably a power shower. And so water consumption in many parts of the United Kingdom has gone up as a result of this particular piece of marketing. And that's a culture. And then you try and tell various people that we should double the price of water or we should restrict it in a time of drought, and it's not easy to get that message across in that kind of context. So you have to bear in mind that water using cultures is a whole sociology that we haven't really understood. 
The second thing is that we're in a world of what which I call non-Goldilocks. It's never about right. It's always either too much or too little. In the United Kingdom, we had three months of drought. We had hardly rained at all. In my part of the world, Norwich, we got five millimetres in the whole month of March. But in the month of June, May and June, we got about uh, 80 millilitres. And it's very common that in England you create a drought order and the day after that the rains fall for as much as three or four months. And what we're dealing with now is a science of water where the unexpected is the norm, where the exceptional becomes the regular. And we don't have a science of this. We don't have a science in the natural world of science, but above all, we don't have a science of communication for people for this kind of uncertainty. So there is what I now call a sustainability science, which is a science essentially of scenarios and essentially a science of storytelling, rather a science of modelling and special forms of prediction. And that's a new world. It's a world that we're not used to uh, in terms of dealing with science. We're now in Britain particularly emphasising the fact that water is a product of nature, which is not uncommon in many other countries, and Lee's already touched upon it from the Australian context, but to give the sense that water is actually the basis around which we all exist, and then we draw from it a bit of it in consumption use for drinking and for hygiene and for day-to-day -day household chores, and then return it to nature is not something that most people realise. You know, two-thirds of young people in urban Britain don't even know that milk comes from a cow. Ninety percent of young people in Britain have no idea that water comes from a natural phenomenon called the water cycle. So we really are in another world when it comes to getting this sense of empathy for water that Lee's been touching on in the Australian context. And that's an issue that can't be underestimated in the analysis that we're doing in the next two days. I'm actually rather keen on this idea of a catchment ambassador. And it's not an easy concept to get across, and I'll say a little bit more about it right at the end. But the, I think the test for governance is to break through the cultural barriers and create shared values and understand what these empathies are for long term and for the natural world in which we live. And the role of the Cashman ambassador isn't necessarily a single individual. It's a mechanism of communication, which is as much about listening as it is about talking. And we're all very good at talking, not always as good at listening. And that relationship is something we need to do a lot more about. Now, I'm sure there'll be some questions from you about that, so I'm going to leave it hanging in the air in the hope there'll be some more questions. And, and, and I want to emphasise also that everything about regulation planning and financing for water stewardship is not on the table right now. It's designed for another age. And so we need to rethink regulation, we need to rethink planning, we need to rethink financing when we come into water stewardship, and we need to bring them all together into a common agenda. And I'll explain this a little bit more in my uh, more detailed side of these things. And then the other big word, ambassador is one word I want you to go away with by the, before the night is out, and resilience is the second. It's the capacity to be responsive, and the capacity to be robust. You have to have strength when you're resilient, and you also have to have adaptability when you're resilient. And actually, given what I've just given you in all the bullet points above, we are very far away from creating resilient systems, and that is something we'll be discussing in some length. Now, to get to water, I want to say a little bit about, few, about the bigger picture before I get to the slightly narrower version of England, because in the United Kingdom, water is a country-based phenomenon. There's a different water system in Scotland and in Wales and in Northern Ireland, but now concentrate only on England. But let me just say, since this is the week of the conference in Rio plus 20, that the hot topic is called planetary boundaries. People haven't got their heads around. And a group of people called the Resilience Alliance back in 2009 before the Copenhagen summit on climate change created this model of what they saw was the Earth systems. And the idea is that this green orb, or roughly olive orb, is the boundary. And anything which goes beyond it is breaking the boundary. And you see that the big baby is biodiversity loss, where we are heroically altering 
the planetary system. And the second one is climate change, I'm saying very little about that. And the third one, which we don't say an awful lot about, is that the nitrogen cycle is massively altered as a result of the artificial chemical conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into oils and plastics. And then we have these creeping danger areas like ocean acidification, which could get to here and would be fantastically catastrophic. And then we have also the phosphorus cycle, which is, funnily enough, far more worrying than people realize. The actual availability of phosphorus right now is only 40 years, and it's a critical element in the fertilizer trade. And then we have some gaps. We don't know much about atmospheric aerosol loading, and we don't know anything about lots of chemical pollution, which I won't go into. But the argument, which is itself something we can spend some time on tonight, is that we're actually beginning as a human species to cross a series of planetary boundaries. And within the lifetime of my grandchildren, certainly, and will be across most of them. Now, what we don't know is what happens at that point. And there's a lot of debate. And the most likely outcome, which is my pet topic, but I won't spend too much time on it, is the issue of so-called tipping points. That is where bits of the Earth's system become catastrophically altered and you don't know the outcome when you cross a tipping point because it's in no man's land. It's literally an area we have no recognition of, even from the, the science. Now, the hot tipping points are the Arctic sea ice, where recent work done for the polar side of things is showing that the most likely scenario now is the removal of Arctic ice completely I mean, within the next 25 years, roughly 2037, is now the new calculation. But I should think by the year 2020, it'll be down to 2032. This is a really interesting area. I, we haven't got time to go into it, but these are global in their implications of their local and their apparent provenance, because that has big implications for the weather patterns of the whole of Northern Europe. You'll get it in British Columbia. We're certainly going to get it in the United Kingdom, because it adds to long periods of cold weather, would you believe, and long periods of snow. So the uh, hazard associated with winter conditions will be much more significant. So that's one. This one, <clears throat> is much more seri serious than people realise the drying out of the Amazon rainforest, and that will have huge implications for the whole of the circulation of the Atlantic system and for the climate, and particularly in Western Europe. So that's another of the hot topics which are likely to become significant, the, uh, if, if the, the, if middle, the middle level. And the third one are the changes in the monsoons and, and the implications for big um, communities. Uh, if these monsoons change dramatically, are quite <clears throat> remarkable. Now, I'm saying this because a lot of these things are water-related, and it's particularly the Amazon, and we tend to forget how globally important water is. So let me give you some statistics that you may know about, but which nevertheless need to be explained. The World Bank has recently come to the conclusion that the cost of mismanaging water is 10% of the global economy. I mean, that's an almost unimaginable amount of money, but we're taking 10% of our wealth out in trying to sort out our water management. And, and that figure could well double over the next 10 years if we carry on. And these are the statistics which give you some sense of that. I won't, you can read them for yourself, <clears throat> but we tend to forget how significant that they are. Let me just put this idea of 6,000 children dying every day. You look at the bridge over the, um, in, in, in Vancouver, uh, across the, the Narrows, and you lay out 6,000 children on that, and you get some idea of what this means. That means literally children next to each other across the whole of that bridge every day. And we don't think like this, it's just a statistic, but if that, you were to see that in front of you, it would certainly shake you up, and that's every day. <clears throat> and then we have this major issue of the lack of fresh water, which is becoming significant. And by 2025, that's 5.3 billion people, which is a, a, obviously a, a, a bigger number because in 2025 there'll be more overall population. But that's two-thirds of the current population. 
It's always worth bearing in mind that the poorest are the ones who suffer most in all of these things, and that buying bottled water is actually about a quarter of the income of very poor people. And by the way, for every litre of bottled water, you use five litres of fresh water. So you, you, there should be a ban on bottled water in restaurants. We don't follow it, but there ought to be, <clears throat> because it is such an extraordinary environmental damaging thing and a real con as well. And we're not getting where we're near the Millennium Development Goal for Water, which is one of the most important uh, goals overall. And just to remind ourselves that we don't have any new water to get. It's not possible. All we can do is to reallocate what we've got now. Um, Oliver did ask me to put some comfort, emphasis on this, and I'm doing it because I know I've only got 10 or 15 minutes left. But I do think we ought to be wearing in mind that the, the, the context of water is deeply damaging to societies, the way we're doing it right now. And the stress that water is placing upon the world is in the places which are most poor and most in conflict. And if you think of the next 25 years, a real shortage of water it lies from Senegal in Western Africa to Beijing and China, and a strip of land which is roughly the same as a lunar eclipse, about a thousand kilometers. Now look in that area, and you've got the whole of North Africa, the whole of the Middle East, and right across Pakistan into Northern India, through to, to in Tibet, and then to southern and central China. These are areas which are massively populated. They're growing like crazy. They're urbanizing like crazy. And they are full of conflict. I you just have to get ahead around the fact that these are going to be situations almost unimaginably dangerous in 20 years' time we don't sort out our water stewardship. Right, so that gives you what I call the global picture. Let me now give you what goes on in, United, in England as I said before, and, and, and now I'm going to go fairly fast, but, but Oliver and Rob and others did invite, ask me to say a little bit about the international picture. What we have in England, which is a, an, an important thing, is that we've privatised water. And you need to, in Canada, be careful about any decision to privatise water. But it is important that when you have private water companies, three things happen from that. The first one is that most people regard water now as something that people are getting money from and making a profit out of, especially when it's a monopoly provision, which it is in most of the English scene. You don't get choices in water. One company delivers it for you, and that's it. So most <coughs> people see these private water companies as essentially cash cows, making lots of money for themselves. And it's not surprising <coughs> that two-thirds of the water companies in England, they're actually owned by, com by companies which are not English. They're German or they're French. So they, they know where they can make their money and they put investment into the English water companies because they are a one-way certain bet. And that's why there's so much argument about this. To get round that, we have a thing called Ofwat, which is our Office of Water Regulation. <clears throat> and its job is to try and keep custom prices down. And every five years, it forces this lot to have an asset management plan and a price review. And between them, there's a big battle. And this battle is actually highly to the benefit of these people. And this lot spend their time fighting them and trying to get a deal over the water companies. But they fail to think long term, <clears throat> and they fail to keep the prices significantly down. But by trying to keep them down, they don't do anything to do with long-term stewardship. So this lot doesn't really deal with sustainability, even though it's meant to have a sustainability guide. Then we have <clears throat> the group which is associated with drinking water quality, which is a separate organization in a separate department. This is in the Department of Business, and this is in the Department of Environment. But they are very much involved with European-based regulations and water um, quality, <clears throat> and they spend their time on complaint management because people worry about smell and colour and spend their time always arguing with this lot here. But they're trying to change the regulation to stop the muck getting into the pipe in the first place, and we'll come on to that. This lot here is the main government department, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. If you'd like to know, in the Cabinet of 25, this is ranked 23. So uh, Secretary of State for this lot is regarded as low quality in, in the pecking order of things. And they are the policy framing people, and they do the support of science. 
And then you have on the environmental side, the Environment Agency, which deals with overall water protection and water allocation and what's called catchment care. And then local governments are supposed to be responsible for planning and sustainable drainage, but they don't do that at all well. And they don't do this in relation to that at all well. But nevertheless, they are the body associated with flood protection and overall planning and settlement. What are you getting there for? <clears throat> this is the main policy lot. These two are fighting each other. This lot is in right field and struggling to get any recognition and constantly being hustled by the customer. And this lot here is being bereft of resources because of government cuts. So what are the key issues? And I'll run this out and then we'll have a discussion between, in, in this. First of all, these different regulatory bodies, the bodies associated with customers and the bodies associated with water quality, the two, top picture, the two in the top of the previous picture, they're in conflict with the notion of sustainable water care. They don't have the mandate to do this, and they're constantly in two different government framings. The off what people are in a business and treasury framing, and the um, drinking water inspector and environment agency are in environment, and a much lower pecking order and budget cut framing. So you just simply cannot get these two ma major areas of regulation, customer and price on one side and competition, and environment and protection on the other, in the same ballpark when it comes to the way governments structure themselves and plans work. <clears throat> Off what has this five-year price horizon. And so it changes the way labour contracts work. This is something that um, Patrick would be interested in. Each, each time you get to end of a price contract, you have to renegotiate all your labour contracts. And so the big consulting companies cut the labour force in the last year and have to re-employ because they don't know what the new deals will be. This is no way to do long-term asset management over a 25-year period. So it's a completely weak system. <clears throat> the water inspector can't really regulate up the pipe. They're concerned about pollutants going in from toxic chemicals, from once runoff from all kinds of um, hard surfaces, in, but industrial surfaces and farm surfaces. And they can't really <clears throat> stop this going on at the beginning of the process. They can't change the formulations and they can't change pharma or in, industrial behavior. And they would love to be able to get at a much earlier point in the recognition. This is what Lee was talking about. <clears throat> if you get into ecosystem values of one kind or another, you actually don't have a property rights arrangement for doing this. If you want all the area around the floodplain to be designed to run for floods in a 200-year flood, you need to have all the property functioning the same way, i.e. clear of development. But there's nothing that allows that to happen in the United Kingdom context or in the England context. We just do not have land use covenants which allow for these property rights to be the same for certain kinds of ecosystem services. <clears throat> and this is a real weakness in the system. And then we have not the science and so on. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the final bit of all of this is we don't have the recognition between the people who are likely to benefit, which could be anything from the water companies for lower water treatment costs or for lower piping costs if you run your flooding and drainage in different ways. <clears throat> and also for the way in which we don't know who actually owns these assets any longer, because if you've got water underground, it's not owned by the riparian owner. It's owned by some kind of loose collective, which is not identified. So if farmers want to protect water by running water underground for longer-term value, there's no mechanism for making them the asset holder when you want to pay them for that particular water right. Because I'm now at the end of it, I'm not going to go through all the rest of my things. I just want you to sort of draw your attention to four or five things which I think would be relevant for the British Columbia scene. The first thing I would suggest is that we need much more to be flexible about the way we see water futures and use this in the context of a community dialogue, storytelling, getting children involved and developing community forums which are much more open-ended about the way they're prepared to see the uncertainties of water so that it, the very fact that water is so indeterminate in terms of its availability is something that we can actually have a dialogue around rather than have scientists can manage and control in a particular way. The second thing is the notion of the pilot scheme, which I've been learning about today from 
Patrick and his colleagues, I don't think you should underestimate that in this area where so many things are unknown and where the systems of regulation and reallocation of pricing and so on are so going to have to be worked through with care, you need to test things out and be prepared to be quite adventurous in testing things out. So the organisations should be encouraged to loosen their rules for a period of time, at least a period of five years and possibly ten, so that you can try these pilots out without the rules being too fixed, even though they may still apply elsewhere. And I'd urge you in the governance conference the next two days to examine really interesting schemes of piloting where you break the rules and allow people to have much more free interchange of ways of approaching things. The third suggestion I'm going to come for you is one I will call, because it's a Canadian word, watershed ambassadors. And by that I mean, first of all, a mechanism whereby you can get people to talk at the level of policy making about the issues we're raising here. All the things I gave in the previous dialogue, the failings of the regulatory system, the failings of the property rights system, the failings of the way we can finance and plan these things because we don't have planners with this kind of knowledge of ecosystem functions. And I think we should also have ambassadors who can go into catchments and enable communities to be much more open about their own cultures and then realise that their cultures need some form of accommodation to other cultures. And this goes right through the whole gamut of the uh, water-interested parties in any given area, catchment or watershed, whatever you want to call about it. And then find ways of bringing together beneficiaries and asset holders and the new water stewardship through these pilot schemes so that people can see real outcomes from that. And then finally, <clears throat> because I think it's a particularly relevant question for the whole of this exercise, is that you want to champion throughout Canada that water is now a critical resource for testing humanity and its capacity to be appropriate for a planet that cannot actually, uh, it's, it's not that the planet will disappear, the planet is robust enough to take anything we give it, but if the planet doesn't manage to maintain habitability, then the next generation and the one after that will be the significant losers. So the water is a touchstone for a debate which we're beginning to have about some kind of legal protection for the rights of future generations to not to be molested by the decisions we're taking today. We're calling in England the Ombudsman for Future Generations, a mechanism of guaranteeing that decisions that we take now are calibrated for 50 years ahead in the context of sustainability and stewardship and not for five years ahead in the context of price review and uh, budgetary restriction and staffing shortage. That's the difference. When you have a commission or an ombudsman for future generations, you break the rules which are constraining good water management right across the board. So I wouldn't underestimate the significance of that. It's symbolic at one level, but it's highly powerful at another. So there you are. Five things <clears throat> you can do in Canada from the experience that we're struggling with in England, and then you'll be better off by far. Understand your cultures, <clears throat> build in a notion of sustainability science, start creating a set of catchment ambassadors, change the way you allocate water rights, and start looking for future generations so they are touchstone for stewardship now to break all the other things into a common agenda, which is an agenda of stewardship and care and empathy and not an agenda of constriction and narrow-minded thinking. Thank you very much. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rob Delow. Uh, he, he brings us a little closer to home. We've traveled very quickly around the globe. Rob isn't from that far away. He's a Canadian from uh, the University of Waterloo. Rob holds the University Research Chair in Water Policy and Governance at the University of Waterloo and is director of the Multi-University Water Policy and Governance Group. Previously, he held the Canada Research Chair in Water Management at the University of Guelph. And during the past two decades, Rob has written extensively about water security, related concerns such as source protection, water allocation, and climate change adaptation. I can personally attest he is a true leader in the field of water governance in Canada and indeed abroad. 
He's been an important intellectual mentor for our program at Polis, and I'm proud to say that we've successfully been working together for the last 10 years and will continue to do so. So uh, Rob's going to kick off our sort of next phase of the evening where we're going to hit the conversation stage. He's going to reflect, integrate, um, offer some fantastic nuggets of wisdom, no pressure. And, but then I'm going to moderate a conversation that hopefully we can get some people to come to the mic. And as a little bit of an incentive, I'll warn you that I've planted some questions. So if we don't see the natural progression to the mics, those uh, planted folks will come to the mic and you may not like the questions they ask. So. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Oliver, for the, for the kind words and for uh, our collaboration on this event here. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Unfortunately, Oliver made a, a fundamental miscalculation. After about 14 hours, my brain starts to hibernate and I can't see anymore. Uh, and I've been up for 18 hours. So how this is going to go remains to be seen here. So my job as a, a discussion, as a discussant tonight, is to try and point to a few things that might plant the seeds of, uh, of more questions, kickstart a discussion, tie some little bits and pieces together. So. Uh, it's, it's particularly challenging if you've ever had to do it because I had a chance to see some drafts of the talk, but then, uh, then our speakers went off and changed their talks, right? So, <laughs> so I've been frantically typing as we were going here to try and, uh, and make it sound like we were at the same session. Um, so I focused on four things that, that stood a lot, uh, out a little bit for me. And remember, these are just four things that somebody sitting in the audience listening to the talks happened to connect. You'll all have connected your own dots, and these are some of the dots that I connected. Uh, and I'll speak to them in turn, but what I'm talking about is the universal nature of, of the governance problems, uh, huge variations in the drivers or pressures for reform, uh, the importance of the assumptions that underlie governance, uh, the fact that there are lots of tools in the toolkits. And each one of these things is important to me because of the implication it has. And then I also have a bit of a, of a larger takeaway that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lay out for you at the very end. So the first one, the idea that these, these challenges that, uh, that our colleagues Lee and Tim are talking about uh, are, are really incredibly widespread. All around the world, people are struggling with, with challenges like that. Uh, BC is in the midst of a major water reform process right now, and, and that might be the reason that many of you showed up tonight, because you're interested in or engaged or, or part of that province, uh, part of that, uh, of that exercise. All provinces and territories in Canada, to varying degrees, are grappling with similar kinds of challenges, whether it's outdated legislation, finding ways to adapt to growing pressures and deal with new problems, who knows, right? So, so we had two terrific examples tonight of how things work in other countries. And I love examples like this uh, because they, they create a little bit of that common feeling that you know we're not alone. Like, we're dealing with some big challenges, but so are other people. And, and that's, that's good news because there's the potential that we can learn something from those challenges. Uh, what can we take away from the experiences of other places uh, so that we can put perhaps better reforms in place faster? So that's, that's the good part of looking at uh, an example like the ones we looked at tonight. The challenges we'll see is doing that in a way that isn't naive because learning lessons from other places is actually really hard, learning them well. Um, the sources of pressure for, report, uh, for reform of, of water governance really, I think, are very different, and we really saw that in our two cases. Um, in the case of Australia, the you know, concern for the way in which water limits economic growth and development was a critical initial driver of reform. Uh, that decade-long drought concentrates attention on water in an unprecedented way. We have droughts in Canada. We have parts of the country that are, are semi-arid, borderline arid. Um, we have local water shortages, even in a place like Ontario where I live, there are locally significant droughts that crop up and do a lot of damage and have major economic and environmental implications. But holy moly, I mean, the, the scale of the drought that occurred in Australia uh, is something that most Canadians cannot get their heads around. So uh, different kinds of drivers in England, though. We had a, a balance of local drivers, such as reforms relating to drinking water provision, external drivers, such as you know, meeting the requirements of the European Union's water framework directive. Crisis is, is very often a, a major driver. Certainly where I'm from in Ontario, um, we were very busily throughout the 1990s, like many places in Canada, 
forgetting about water. I mean, we were collectively forgetting about water. It was absolutely unbelievable. We sometimes like to blame particular governments, uh, but frankly, all of the various political parties that have been in charge in Ontario over the last uh, couple of decades were contributing to the collective amnesia about water. Everything that's happened in Ontario uh, has, in, the, in recent decades has been about the shock and the crisis that caused us to remember. And that, of course, was the tragedy in Walkerton in 2000 that took those seven lives and 2,300 uh, people very, very ill, many of them to this day. So it's incredible how that sharpened our attention in Ontario. The problem is that crisis is, generally speaking, a lousy basis for being very thoughtful. So, so our challenge is how do we, how do those of us who care about water all the time, I mean, if you came here tonight, there were other things you could do. It's a gorgeous evening. Oliver tells me the weather's been lousy for, for a while in Victoria, but you came here, right? So you care about water. How do those of us that are engaged uh, take advantage of the, of the drivers and pressures that exist to try and lever, so, leverage some attention? That's, that's one of the challenges we have, to, we have to face too. Okay, number three is the point about underlying assumptions. And, and that came out really clearly in Tim's point. And it's something that, that I took away from what I know about Australia and what I know from experiences uh, uh, in, in other countries like England. Um, Lee's talk highlighted some of the, of the really important underlying assumptions in Australia, the idea that water quality and availability are determinants of economic security and prosperity. I think, I mean, that's, that's a key underlying assumption, the idea that coordination at the national level is essential. I mean, that's, that's an underlying principle for water governance in Australia that makes me very jealous in Canada because, because we're a federation too. There's a lot of similarities in that respect. And we can't, we can't make that connection yet. The idea that local action is important, but it's nested within an overarching framework is, is a pretty important assumption in Australia. And the idea that markets are the most efficient way to allocate scarce resources among competing human uses is something that is another kind of bedrock principle that's emerged in Australia now. Tim's talk points to uh, other kinds of assumptions that I think are characteristic of the UK. You know, the idea that authority should remain at the national level and be exercised a little bit more through regulation and administrative procedures. The idea that private companies have key roles to play. Uh, that local action will occur through municipalities and catchment-based collaborative bodies. The takeaway here is, is that any time I think you're intrigued by somebody else's system, you've always got to kind of stop and say, okay, now, what are, those, what are those underlying assumptions that explain why they're doing what they're doing? Because, of course, if they don't match or if they're not compatible with the assumptions in your own country, your own province, your own community even, then the model you're looking at might not be the right one. All right, so fourth little takeaway, and then I'll wrap it up with the, with the larger overall message. Um, there are lots of tools in the toolkit, and that's something I like to emphasize again and again. I mean, all around the world, we, we are experimenting, and, and I thought Tim's point was about, you know, piloting speaks to that point that that so often the way we govern water is, is a kind of experiment. It's not that people are setting out to spend all this time and energy and say, hey, let's, you know, let's just do a flyer here. We'll, we'll try something, we'll see if it works. Uh, it's, it's not really like that. I mean, each society kind of makes some choices about how to solve the problems, and, and each one of those choices then becomes a living experiment that we can observe. And boy, there's a lot of variation all around the world. Uh, England and Australia are two great examples for illustrating how countries are combining top-down regulatory approaches with more bottom-up styles of governing and trying to bring those together. So in both countries, senior governments define the framework for governance, which creates space for catchment or watershed-based collaborative planning, something that I'm very interested in right now as well, to kind of fit in there. Uh, England is distinctive because of the roles of the private companies and because of of the relationship with the, uh, with the European Union. Australia is really fascinating to me for a whole bunch of reasons. This idea that the, state, that the states, you know, their version of our provinces, and the Commonwealth, their version of our federal government, are willing to coordinate action and to have a national perspective on key shared priorities. Again, that's something that we could really do better, much better in Canada. Um, again, in, in Australia, the distinctive role of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that Lee talked about as a transboundary governance arrangement 
is, is something that uh, it's not only an internationally important example, but it's also relevant for uh, a country like Canada. When we think of uh, our, we don't have a Murray-Darling Basin uh, in terms of the economic significance of the basin, but we have, uh, we have the Mackenzie River Basin right now in Canada, which is very economically significant and growing and which is a critical transboundary resource. What can we take away from, from a Murray-Darling kind of example? Uh, the key takeaway again here on that fourth point is that there are lots of tools in the toolkit, but cut and paste isn't gonna work, right? Uh, it's never an option. The trick is to see how can we, in a very sophisticated and savvy way, learn from these novel experiments that are going on in other countries. Okay, so to try and kickstart things tonight, to wrap it up, I pointed to four things that, for me, stood out a little bit as I listened to the talks and as I looked at some of the earlier drafts of the talks, the idea that the, the problems are widespread, that lots of people have the problem, in other words, that the sources of pressure, the drivers of change are diverse. There's lots of different drivers and they vary and they may not be the same as the ones we're facing. Um, the critical role of whatever the underlying assumptions that reflect cultures and politics and society, we gotta know what those are. You have to clarify what they are before a lesson becomes relevant and the fact that there are lots of tools in the toolkit. The takeaway for me that ties this all together, I think, is the idea that um, we have to be a little bit systematic about how we learn lessons from other places. So we have to pay attention to the nature of the policy problem, right? Are we trying to solve the same problem? Do we have the same goals, right? So whenever somebody says to you, you know, those people in Australia are doing something that might be relevant for BC or Alberta, Ontario, or you know, wherever you are, you have to always stop and ask yourself, okay, but you know, are they solving the same kind of problem that we're facing here? Because obviously if they're solving a different problem, it's not gonna fit. Uh, the characteristics of the example that you think is interesting, right? So if you look at an Australian or an English example and you think, wow, you know, that's something that we ought to try on too. You have to be really analytical. You have to be really sophisticated about thinking is, well, how complicated is their example, the policy or the institution that they're using? Because the more complex it is, uh, the more difficult it is to, to, to uh, adopt that example. Does it create lots of externalities for other people, because those are always tough to implement. Uh, what are the underlying assumptions? Are they compatible, right? So you have, to, you have to be really very sophisticated about looking at the thing you're trying to learn the lesson from. Um, and the third thing you have to pay attention to is the, is the context in which it developed. Every experiment, as I've suggested a second ago, that's happening somewhere in the world, reflects some unbelievably local circumstances, whether it's culture, politics, history, society, but it also reflects a certain level of technical capacity, of human resources, of financial commitment. If those things don't exist in the place that, that you would like to use somebody else's idea, yeah, you know, then, then you have a real problem in terms of uh, learning from that experience. So the challenge I'd like to leave you as you listen to examples like the ones we heard tonight is to think about those kinds of questions. Think about bringing that, uh, that sharper analytical lens to asking, well, is that something that would fit here uh, if, if you're under the impression that it's working well in some other place? Okay, so thanks very much. Just a few thoughts to, uh, to leave for you. I'm sure you all are you know, full of questions and ideas for our speakers as well and have lots of things you'd like to follow up and maybe other people have made some other connections. So hopefully some of that'll come out. All right, thanks Oliver. I know it's always a risky proposition when uh, usually Rob and I discuss these things, but he didn't have a time limit, so he was very kind to us by working within a, a good, succinct message. Now, I don't want to see everybody charging to the mics here, but we do want to open up a bit of a dialogue, so that's going to involve you folks if we want it to work. So I see somebody coming here. Chris, do you want to start us off? Sure, I'll give it a go. Um, the problem that uh, Chris called, by the way, uh, no Tim reasonably, um, the, the challenge that I think we face is the challenge of externalities. I'm a land economist, so obviously I'd see it that way. Um, what I'm hearing from Tim's speech is though, that those externalities are a problem. And um, the one thing that we pretty much know from carbon is that those externalities are not being correctly priced. So if we look at water, we know that water is incorrectly priced. 
And the one thing that I'm pretty sure of is that you can't do stewardship correctly of water unless you really have truly priced those externalities, which include not only what happens when you receive the water, but what happens when you've dealt with the water, so sewage disposal and, and the consequences of that. Um, all I'm seeing is substantial market failure from an economic perspective, and I wonder particularly, Lee, whether there is pricing in Australia and then Tim in the UK um, for dealing properly with water because I don't think the market works. If I can just come in on that. The reforms that were put in place that I discussed were actually premised, the efficiency idea was premised on the idea that you weren't costing externalities. So in part, the 1994 COAG reforms were directly around the idea that you put in place a <coughs> property rights system, you make you deal with it as a scarce resource, you put in property rights, and then you leave it to the market to efficiently allocate. So that was the economic presumptions on which that reform process proceeded. Um, in an urban water context, yes, there were strong moves under the NWI and in, indeed earlier to put in effect um, a price that better reflected uh, the process of dealing with water. Uh, we do have an urban water regulatory authority very similar to the UK experience that's, that is a third party regulator that sets prices. But because of political pressures, I think it, it doesn't set them high enough. But clearly things like the delivery charge that I mentioned in the unbundled system were clearly meant to uh, pick up um, externalities in the, or the public funding, for example, that was going into public infrastructure. So yeah, we've had rising block tariffs, um, those sorts of things being experimented <coughs> with. Again, not not yet meeting sort of anywhere like a true cost. In, in order to have plenty of questions, I'll keep my answer mm -hmm. shorter than than I would like to to answer your question, Chris. But actually, the argument in England is the reverse of what you're saying. Uh, externalities is a failure of the market. And what the English line is now is that we should actually properly value water, not price it, value it, before we even begin to use it. So that you're creating a completely different mindset for handling water. Now, for doing that, and I didn't have time, and it wasn't appropriate for this talk tonight, summarize three initiatives that England is doing that might, you might want to think about in British Columbia or in Canada overall. One is the creation of a natural capital committee, which is a committee looking at the overall value of natural systems and also of natural resources. And that committee will report to Treasury, to our finance ministry. And I gave you that the environment ministry was number 23 in the ranks. Well, the business ministry is number three and the Treasury is number one and lying in between is the foreign office. So you're talking about big time when you get to that level. So one thing I would suggest you think about doing, and I know you're thinking about this, Chris, you told me already, already is create some kind of natural capital account, which takes you away from ex externalities, if you do it right. The second thing we're talking about, which is much more contentious, is changing the pricing regime using smart meters. Now, smart meters tell you exactly how you're using water for whatever purpose. And there is a proposal from the Institute of Civil Engineers that we give British people or English people a basic amount of water at a low price for, say, washing and hygiene and normal household stuff. And after that, you start raising the price. So for so non-essential usage, you put the price much higher. And then in drought conditions, you jack the prices up all over the place. Now, Michael Sandel, who's a name you probably know, professor of philosophy in Harvard, has written a very interesting book called The Moral Failure of the Markets. And, and what he actually points out, when you do pricing like this, what you do is you do two things which you really need to think about. You deeply penalize the poor, so it's a very inequitable arrangement from the point of view of social cohesion, and you change the moral value of the, the product. If you price water like that, it has no meaning as a natural resource or a spiritual context. So by changing pricing systems, you actually worsen the cultures of water, not increase them. That's a lesson to be learned about the pricing advocates. The third thing is we're talking about water offsets, which Lee also touched on, we'll spend some time on. Every time you use water, you're taking something out of the natural system. So the new thinking in England 
is the idea of the offset, that every developer should be putting money and resources back into the natural system in equal to what they've taken up in order to get that development underway. That is a really interesting area, also extremely uh, controversial. I won't go into the controversies because it's very difficult to get equivalent value for this kind of thing. But what it does do is gives you community-based resources to do the kind of thing that Patrick is doing, creating new bits of eco ecological infrastructure as part of the developmental process. So I would certainly look at that in Canada, but be wary that that act itself is also controversial in terms of whether you actually get total value of the natural system unchanged as a result of what you're doing. But these are three areas in relation to your question that I think are worthy of exploration over here. Hi, I'm Deborah Harford. I just have a, a question for Lee. Actually, I've got lots of questions for Lee, but I'm trying to slim it down to something manageable. Um, environmental water holder agency that buys back water and applies it to endangered ecosystems, where, do, where does it get the money? And who oversees what it does with how does, where it puts it? And uh, the other question that I'll give you, uh, the other one is who funds water ca catchment management? But too many, may, when I tell you all my questions, you can choose which ones to answer. Who funds catchment management? The environmental water holder one. And then you mentioned that the water markets are carefully structured and run by rules. I was curious as there are there, obviously there are restrictions on what you can do with the water um, when you buy it. And who oversees that and how are those restrictions enforced? Wow. Okay, I'll start with the um, environmental water holder. The Commonwealth won public monies. These are, this is, there was a lot of money set aside, uh, $10 billion uh, with the 2007 uh, Commonwealth legislation. Part of it went to infrastructure upgrades, but a large part of it went to funding the Commonwealth uh, buybacks. They, they were co and continue to be quite controversial. They were also uh, controversial in the sense that they, they were somewhat ad hoc because it was willing sellers. So how you actually sit water planning alongside and uh, what are now major water holdings held by the environmental water holding um, is an issue that's really just up there for grabs at the moment. With the Victorian environmental water holder, same thing. It really is now a, a governance mechanism that consolidates the uh, lots of little itty bitty environmental water holdings that uh, the minister, so it's a step away from direct ministerial control that was typically delegated down to catchment management authority and managed at a catchment level. On the question of funding of catchment management authorities, um, they're an interesting structure because they actually have a community board of management. I didn't have a chance to go into the detail there, but they have a community board of management, but they also run as a quasi agency. So they're, they're a really interesting thing. They sit between a statutory authority and a community board. So they have both there. Now, if they are. They are, uh, funding remains a perennial problem for catchment management authorities. There's a lot of volunteer work goes in because they uh, rely on the land care type voluntary. That, the big thing was to bring private landowners into the mix. So this is the mechanism through catchment management. So many of the volunteers, the, the, the community, will be land, landowners, uh, landowners. So you've got the private um, land ownership in, in the mix. Um, they are funded by state governments in Victoria, but you also have a lot of Commonwealth on a project by project basis, which is a perennial problem because there's a lot of time spent trying to get project money and it alters the focus a bit. I did have a, a slide that I didn't include, but I can send it to you if you like, that talks a little bit about strengths and weaknesses around that model. Uh, have I answered all of them? Uh, no, I, I, I was just asking other restrictions on what you do. Uh, oh, okay. Um, buy water and who oversees it. And okay, the environmental water holder, there, within the uh, water law in Victoria, for example, um, the way it's managed is um, now the, the environmental water holder will have a role in working out how it's deployed for high priority assets. 
the, the catchment resource strategy that I was talking about sets priorities and it will set you know, the Karanga light one. If you're, you're interested in this, have a look at it online because what it does is it takes Tim's idea of valuing and it says, okay, in a catchment, we've got so much money, our investment strategy, but what do we value most? So it's an attempt by the community to working with the, the CMA to work out what what's the values, what are most valued, therefore what should get the funding. So that's how it works. So, yeah. And yeah, look it up on the web and you can see how it all works. <laughs> so I think we're going to run about another five minutes and we'll wrap up. But uh, So get your questions ready. I'm going to ask one, however, and I'm just going to ask maybe the three panellists to reflect on, I mean, Rob made a really interesting point. You know, we have to learn some lessons, but let's not be naive about the learning of lessons, but there's, I think, an equal tension around uh, inaction or, or, in a sense, getting it wrong by, by moving slowly because my sense is that some of these changes are so dynamic. So maybe from your home jurisdiction senses and you as well, Rob, from Ontario's perspective, what are the consequences of if we do get the governance wrong or if we keep the status quo in place? Just maybe your feeling on, on what you think the consequences might be. Do you want us to answer now? Yeah, please. Do you want to go first? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go first. Well <laughs> done. I thought I might get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Um, I, I, I don't think the word is getting it wrong, Oliver. It, it, that in itself is actually the mindset of the bureaucrat. The, the, most of the people in, who are involved in making decisions are risk averse. They're very concerned about making a mistake, mainly because their political masters um, are concerned about them making a mistake, and also because it could lead to cost overruns, which is very, very damaging. Uh, but I think the reason why I suggest that what we're learning from this conference is, and I've really made the point at the beginning of my talk, and I'm going to say it again, about the notion of understanding water cultures and getting them to talk to each other and understand their common interest, particularly for the future. If you start that process and really work on it, and it won't be done overnight, but you could do it over a period of three or four years, you will create the conditions for understanding how to get things right. If you don't do that, you will persistently be in a position where you're almost certainly going to get things wrong. By being wrong, I mean that you're always going to get conflict or uncertainty or frustration, and you'll give rise to slowing down decision-making, making things happen. Now, the trouble we've got in the interim getting this culture right and getting this condition to right, you actually have to change all of those institutions around planning and finance and regulation, and often to do with property rights and ownership. And you need to make these shifts sufficiently to allow real action to happen when the cultures start to form a common alliance. So the, that's why I'm urging us to think about creative experimental schemes. I know that Rob touched on that in his presentation. There are ups and downs to these things because they can often delay. But a really good set of creative experimental schemes put together with learning, going onto a web so you can share the outcome, will get you around this problem. And I, I think, if I may say so, the danger is to ask a question like this, what, how, how can things go wrong? When the real question is, how can we work better to make sure that that mindset isn't there in the first place. I don't, I'm not criticising the question, I'm criticising the framing of the question that people from the governmental side frequently lay at their own policy people. Yeah, if I can just pick up on that, one of the reasons that I started working with sociologists and um, a lot of um, <coughs> interdisciplinary areas was that I saw law as setting in place to rid a system and so it was in that search for understanding of the cultural <coughs> practices that inform institutions and governance that really interested me in, in, in trying to work through some of water governance um, issues and how we might do things better and I, I do uh, really think that that is an important thing and I think the Murray-Darling Basin Authority is a lesson to be learned there in Australia. Um, it was given a very difficult task, but perhaps not being sophisticated enough in how it understood it, the workings of its own institution and how it was, able, was not able to effectively engage the community at, at many levels, I think um, has seen that what was 
potentially a very, very far-sighted reform start to founder. And so I think that's a, an important lesson and in, in, can demonstrate uh, what Tim was saying. So I think we do need to work at things dynam you know, dynamically. And yes, not everything will work. I, I wouldn't actually also like to go on the record as saying I'm a very strong supporter of all things market. In fact, I've been somewhat critical of uh, the market approach because I think what it does is you tend to replace one, if I like uh, to call it one paradigm of governance with another. And so that was sitting behind my idea of fit for purpose. You've got to see what the problem is, how things can best be shaped and influenced. And I think that we often sort of replace, you know, we throw the baby out with the bathwater and then you've got another set of bathwater to be dealing with. And so I think thinking that through very carefully and, and maintaining and shaping um, is, I think, where I, I'd uh, finish on that one. Mm. Mm. Uh, the question is intriguing, Oliver, and, and the, the different answers we've heard so far are, are equally so, because I think it has a couple of levels. One of the things about water that I find really striking is there's often a tremendous amount of inertia. And so when you said get it wrong, I think I understood what you meant in the sense that one of the ways in which we can get it wrong is re is put in place new institutions, for example, that are very, very difficult to change, right? And in other words, that work against any goal we might have to adopting or adapting or experimenting, et cetera. When you look at, when you look at the institutions that we are trying to change in Canada, for example, for water allocation, many of which are over a century old, when you look at the, the length, the, the sort of the age and durability of Australia's institutions and the challenges that were put in place to change them, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can imagine getting it wrong in the sense that by creating more rigidity that prevents flexibility. The other take on that too, though, is, and I guess it's maybe a very Canadian perspective, and, and that's where most of my interests have been, but I got into the water world. I became interested and passionate about water at almost exactly the moment when most of the rest of the country was losing interest in water. So in the late 1990s, if you were active in the water community, I, I genuinely had the sense that with the last person interested in water, please turn out the lights you know, on the way out so that at least we're not wasting any power. Nobody cared like across this country. We had a wonderful surge of interest uh, in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s with the inquiry on federal water policy and it looked like we were stepping out and getting game and it was all gonna be good and then it, I mean the 1990s were really bad as far as that went. It looked like a really bad career move on my point, let me tell you. Um, and, and so it was Walkerton and it was North Battleford and it was droughts on the prairies and it was a glowing, a growing global consensus. But the point of all of this is that fortune is fickle and, and right now we currently are at a, pardon the pun, a high water mark in terms of public interest, interest among, the, among some governments, not all governments by any stretch, uh, interest among the, not the usual suspects, the people that come in a wonderful Victoria Monday night to, to listen to people talking about water, but in the rest of society, there is interest now that hasn't always existed. And so when I look at it as a somewhat slightly cynical person and think, well, we have a moment now, there's a window. And so to come back to your question, Oliver, I think you know, those of us that really care about water and, 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 and addressing some of these challenges that have been with us forever, right? We have this window and we have an opportunity that is not to be, to be blown, if you like. And that's why I'm so kind of careful about, about putting, putting the right building, using the right principles, putting the right design ideas in place. And so that kind of echoes your point, Tim, about you know, designing institutions that permit flexibility and adaptability we have that window now. We might not have it uh, in uh, in a couple of years. You know, you know, you know how it goes. Issue and attention goes up and down. So, anyways, that's in my long and rambling, almost midnight for me response to <laughs> your your question. I mean, the the consequences are more rigidity. The opportunity is putting in place some smart changes now that allow us to come and adapt to changes that we don't even know what they're going to be coming down the pipe. 
Okay. Last question for the evening. Gene, bring us home. Sure, just it'll, that way the, the listeners, midnight, Rob's family can, can tie in and hear your question as well. Oh, okie dokie. Uh, um, Not that there's any but, danger of that, by the way. Well, <laughs> we're, we're in a time where I think Bill McKibben is on the verge of changing the name of 350.org to 450.org. And uh, I'm heavily under the influence of uh, James Kunstler and other American catastrophists. And I really want to ask all of you whether uh, you, um, uh, to reflect on uh, whether you think we're um, uh, in, in a time either of risk to or collapse of policy as a social tool, tool for social change. This is my turn to go first. Go yeah, okay, that's a really interesting question. And I, if I can sort of speak first from the Australian perspective and perhaps offer a, a broader response, I think this was a major social policy response that changed along the way. It started as a major rural social adjustment that I think governments were hands off on politically very contentious to take to do anything with water in Australia. So it was a major social policy. I have actually in other in other discussions talked about water one of the problems is that we don't treat it as social policy. That we are trying to achieve social outcomes as well as environmental outcomes, but I would say more broadly those outcomes through an indirect means of, of water. And I think this is part of why we've seen such tension around the water reforms, because we're seeking to achieve much broader goals, but governments are very hands-off, and this is in part what I was referencing back to the market framing, because then you don't have to take responsibility as a government, because it's the market that will do it for you. So I do think that there are issues about using various regulatory tools and the assumptions that are behind them. And I think in Australia, we have, because it was so difficult and it had to be done, we've tended to distance the social policy. So is it a failure? Uh, there are very many competing answers to that one. Some people say that it's a, a a great success, and certainly it's had a lot of success in, as, in some areas, particularly economically, as I said, and it's made rural communities viable that wouldn't otherwise be. More broadly, I think it has been a retreat from social policy, and I think now, unless the, nas the, unless the national government was facing a huge crisis, it doesn't want to go with n anywhere near water. It's been too hard for it. So that's my response. I, I think it's a... It's an insightful question because really if I can interpret it, it almost sounds to me like you're asking, are we out of the era where the problems that we're facing, we can count on the state, on governments to solve them for us. And if I frame it like that, then I will say that despite you know, the, the obvious absence of leadership at some levels, this, uh, I've never been more optimistic, um, paradoxically. I, I've never been... Uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that we, we will continue to need the leadership that, that only governments can provide because of the nature of, of water. There are some things that we, we simply can't farm out to markets and we can't farm out to volunteers. But at the same time, what's different today about the last little surge that we had uh, in Canada in the, in the 1980s, in the 1980s there was a surge, but it was a a surge of interest in water among the usual suspects. And I think, Lee, you framed it very nicely. Water has historically been framed as a technical subject to be solved by technical experts, including technical policy experts. And that was the big surge in the 1980s. The surge that's different now is when you look at who is interested in water and who is playing leadership in water, leadership roles. It's not the usual suspects. So. It's more deeply and more broadly in communities uh, as a social issue as well as an environmental, as an economic issue for sure. So I think that's, a, that's, that's exactly right. But what's 
Equally important, and this is the bit that makes me both nervous and excited in equal measure, is that, that the that sectors in society uh, that actually have the, the power, the raw power to affect some of the changes that we're looking for are waking up to the significance of water. Um, and that's, that's potentially good in the sense that new resources come to the table. And of course, it's potentially bad in that new power comes to the table. When we look at the way that large corporations, for example, uh, are recognizing that water uh, is, a, is a primary driver of their economic viability. Uh, for a long time water person, that's, that's uh, shocking and scary and interesting and all in a big confused model that I haven't sorted out myself. But the point of the story is that we're no longer left to just the usual you know, isolated technical expert being the people who are concerned about water. I think that day is over. And in that sense, um, you know, maybe the, the, the days of sort of the traditional solution that you were, you're, you were pointing to maybe are drawing a little bit more to a close, but a whole new landscape of more networked approaches to government governance involving, you know, all kinds of different actors is coming out there. So that, that part, I think, is, is hopeful. So like I said, I, I'm actually a lot more optimistic now than I was a decade ago. Okay, Tim, bring us home. Um, we're in the business of interpreting questions tonight. Um, you can put any spin you want on that one. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> um, if you walk down the waterfront in, here in Victoria, and ask the first 20 people, what does Rio plus 20 mean to you? I would say the fair chance that 18 would say, what? Certainly if you did that in London. And we're at a week which is meant to reflect on the 40 years of global summits around making this life of human humanity on the planet livable for the two generations or three generations which are likely to make it. After that, it's an extremely dark area. And it is actually of interest that the three things that governments most want, any politician most wants, is economic stability, some form of control of terrorism and military hassle, violence, and something loosely called social cohesion. They're the three things that politicians desperately want for their survival. And if they fail on these three things, the notion of democracy begins to break down. And you're seeing some of that in the continental Europe right now. So I'm reading your question is actually, if we carry on as we are, we won't have policy that will work because it will break down. And for the reasons that I've said to you is that the Rio plus 20 is in itself isn't the answer, but the issues that Rio plus 20 are raising is the answer that we need to be addressing which is that we need a form of economic activity which is explicitly about planetary health, explicitly about social cohesion, explicitly about giving people the opportunity for enterprise within a world that we can live in, in terms of Nietzsche's bounty. That's the real message, the so-called genuine growth as opposed to the fictitious growth of the modern age that we call growth. And the second part of the real message is that we need to rethink how we actually design the way we live into something which is much more about localization. This is not to say that we become simply self-serving at the narrow level, but that we are putting much more resources into collective outcomes that can be managed at the points where people can feel they can handle themselves and the resources around them. And that's why, funnily enough, the watershed is a, is, is a, is a kind of metaphor for localism. And I, I would say that globally and not just in British Columbia, because it is the basis around which communities can identify the things that we really are trying to talk about in Rio Plus 20, not what it will do in the next few days, but what it should do. So my answer to you is that in a curious way, because the three fundamentals are breaking down, growth, security, and cohesion, we may find from that rather unsettled and unruly chaotic condition, the emergence of a process that will give us what I would call watershed governance. And I mean by that, managing ourselves in relation to nature at a level we can understand in our day-to-day -day lives. And the watershed is a metaphor for a form of, I would call, sustainable localism.
But that, that, I think, is where policy becomes something which people themselves create as part of a, a global system. And, and the other side of policy you touched on will, in fact, increasingly be unable to do it unless it creates that holding framework to allow that form of sustainable localism to flourish. Okay, well, on that note, I want to, A, thank our panelists. So let's put our hands together and thank them. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We'll hope to see you all soon again.